I want to talk a little bit about goals on the line of how do you lose 37 pounds and write a book. I'm just going to kind of give you that as an example. For 24 years of my adult life, by choice, I weighed well over 200 pounds. I say by choice because, you see, I have never accidentally eaten anything. I mean, it's always been deliberate. And when I choose to eat too much today, I have chosen to weigh too much tomorrow. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I watch these videos every day because I need them for motivation. Being around successful entrepreneurs every morning helps me believe that I can do great things too. It's like your morning coffee, but for your goals, kickstarting your day with a blast of positivity. So here is a challenge for you. Try watching one video every morning for the next 30 days, and let's find out together if they help you do great things too. If you're in, leave a hashtag believe in the comments below so I can celebrate with you. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Zig Ziglar, and our take on his top 10 rules of success, believe. You can choose to set goals and realize your potential, or you can choose not to set them. Now, if you choose not to set them, you got to understand that the consequences are not going to be good down the road. For 24 years, I was going to lose that weight. As a matter of fact, in 24 years, I lost several thousand pounds of weight. How many of you already know exactly what I'm talking about? But it wasn't until I wrote it down, put a date on it, listed the obstacles I had to overcome, identified the people, the groups, the organizations I needed to work with, spelled out a plan of action, set that time limit in there, and identified all of the benefits to me. It was only when I did that that the goal became a reality and I lost the weight. Now, goals have certain characteristics. For example, we need some big goals and some multiple goals. We need more than one goal. If you just have one goal, you'll end up being a warped individual. Now, if you only have one goal, chances are good you're going to reach it if you really work at it as we've been talking about. Uh, but you don't want to be warped. You need the balance that we're talking about. I'd set the goal of losing the 37 pounds. Now, that is a big goal. You need big goals because big goals force you to reach in and utilize the potential which is there. I love the story of old gentleman Jim Corbett, the former heavyweight boxing champion of the world. Corbett was out doing his road work one morning, and uh, he saw a fisherman who was just having a field day. I mean, he was pulling in the big ones, and he was pulling in the little ones. And Corbett noticed that as he was running past, the fisherman was putting the little fish in his creel, and he was throwing the big ones back in. He couldn't resist it. He walked over to him, or ran over to him, and said, Mr. He said, I've seen a lot of fishermen in my lifetime, but I believe you're the first one I've ever seen who threw the big fish back and who kept the little ones. Now, why in the world would you do a thing like that? And the fisherman sadly shook his head, and he said, Man, I, I hate to do it, but he said, I don't really have any choice. I have to throw the big ones back because, you see, all I've got is just this little old bitty frying pan. Now, before you laugh too, brother, let me point out he's talking to you and about you. And he's talking about me. So many times we get the big goal, the big idea, the big dream, something that would make a big difference not only in our lives but other lives. And no sooner do we get this big goal and we say, oh, no, Lord, don't give me such a big one. All I got is just this little old bitty frying pan. Give me a little one, just a little one. Don't make me stretch. Besides, you know, if the goal was any good, if the idea was any good, somebody else would already have thought about it. Just give me a little one. Folks, you got to have some big goals in life because it's the big goals which really make you reach in and, uh, res and use the resources which are at your disposal. And the resources you have are awesome. Emerson was absolutely right when he said, what lies behind us and what lies in front of us pales in significance when compared to what lies within us. Rule number two is think positive. How many of you ever heard the story of David and Goliath? 
you fixing to get the Ziglarized version, okay? <laughs> you remember the story? Here's old nine foot Goliath, 400 pounds. He's standing up on the hillside, you know, and he's shouting those obscenities. He says, come on, you dogs, come out and fight. Here come little David, 17 years old, running up there, you know, hadn't even started to shave. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he said to his brothers, he said, don't, don't, don't you fellas hear that guy? And he said, yeah, we hear him. David said, what you going to do about it? And they said, what do you mean what you're going to do about it? David said, aren't you going to fight him? They said, are you kidding? Well, man, people get hurt fighting guys like that. <laughs> you know, they looked at old Goliath and figured he is too big to hit. And uh, David looked at him and figured he's too big to miss, you know. <laughs> then he said, where's the king? And the brother said, king don't feel so good. David said, I'll take him on. They said, you're crazy. See, they looked at, Gol at Goliath and compared Goliath's size to theirs. Boy, that made him big. Nine feet tall, 400 plus pounds. David looked at Goliath and compared him to God. And boy, that made him small. And, and in the case, for those of you who have not read the rest of the story, David and God won. Hey there, it's Mark Tim with the Ziegler family. And I sure hope you're enjoying the video from my mentor, the legendary Zig Ziegler. Because you're part of Evan's audience, we want to give you a special bonus. It's a cool little book called The Little Book of Big Quotes, packed with awesome content. This book is free, just for you. Check out the description below, and it's yours. Alrighty, let's get you back to Z. Rule number three is change your performance. You've gotten the things you've gotten based on your performance. Now, the possible exception of that is money. Occasionally, someone inherits that. It, I don't depend on it, but it, it can happen. All of the other things are based on your performance. So, logically, if you want to change what you've got, doesn't it make sense that you've got to change your performance? Because, you see, in the simplest term possible, if you keep on doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep on getting what you've been getting. You gotta change performance. Now, before you can change performance, you gotta change your thinking. Because you see, your thinking, regardless of what you do, has a dramatic impact on that performance. But before you can change your thinking, you've gotta change what goes into your mind. And now we're back where we started you, what you are and where you are because of what's going into your mind. And you can change what you are, you can change where you are by changing what goes into your mind. Zig, you've stressed the importance of input and it really makes sense, but where do we get the right kind of positive input? Well, basically, uh, Jim, we have a number of sources. The associates, the people we're with and around certainly have uh, an input. The people we work with, our families, uh, all of these have inputs. Now, the question is, is it the correct input? A lot of times, unfortunately, the answer to that is no. So to compensate for the negative input, we have to deliberately seek the positive input. By that, I mean we simply need to read the good books, the optimistic, positive thinking, uh, powerful uh, inputs into our mind. We need to listen to those recordings as we are driving to and from. The car can make a marvelous traveling educational institution. We need to listen while we are washing dishes or weeding the flower bed. Uh, we can do those things when we are, well, shaving or applying makeup. That's where we need to have that positive input. Rule number four is respond, don't react. A lot of people have what we call pity parties. You know, the problem with pity parties is very few people come and those who do don't bring presents, okay? <laughs> a lot of people say, yeah, well, let me tell you about my problems. Well, no, let me tell you about 300 world-class leaders. Now I'm talking about Roosevelt and Churchill. I'm talking about Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King. I speak of Clara Barton and Helen Keller and Mother Teresa, 300 world-class leaders. 75% of them were either raised in poverty or had been abused as children, or had some serious physical defect. But they understood for point number three, you see, it is not what happens to you, it is how you handle what happens to you that's going to make the difference. Do you respond to life or do you react to life? Respond as positive, react as negative. 
You get sick, go to the doctor, she gives her prescription, says, see me tomorrow. You walk in the next day and she shakes her head and says, uh-oh, the prescription's not working. Your body is reacting to the prescription. We got to change. You get nervous. But if she smiles and says, hey, it's working, your body is responding to treatment, then you feel pretty good. You believe everything's going to be all right. Now, we can choose to respond or we can choose to react. Thomas Edison, for example, chose to respond. At age 67, his factory burned down. Two million dollar loss. And in those years, that was a lot of money. He had no insurance. Now, he looked at that and he said, in every tragedy, there is much to be learned. He said, they just burned up all of our mistakes. Thank God we can start over. Three weeks later, they delivered the first phonograph. Responding to life is so important. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight our favorite lessons from the video that will inspire you to remember what you learned today and actually apply them. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five is fix your attitude. When somebody says, how you doing? And you really are doing bad. I mean, things are just awful. What I want you to do is look at your watch. When they say, how you doing? I want you to look at your watch and say, well, at exactly 3.30, I'll be doing super good. And they might say, well, what's going to happen at 3.30? Then you say, at 3.30, I'm going to be positive. Now, I'm going to be negative until then. But man, at 3.30, I'm going to get positive. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do I understand this right? You're going to be negative until 3.30. And then from 3.30 on, you're going to be positive. I sure am, man, a lot. I can't wait for 3.30 to get here because then I'm going to be positive. They say, now, are you kidding me? You mean you're going to wait till 3.30 to be positive? Why don't you go ahead and be positive now? Then you look at him and you kind of smile and say, you smooth talker, you. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you're such a smooth talker, you'd do good in my business. And then <laughs> what I'm saying is, you're, you're probably thinking there, Zayla, that's about the silliest thing that I've ever heard of in my life. And you know, I agree with that. But I'll tell you what it does. It works. You know what you're doing? You're kidding yourself. You're laughing at you. And see, when you can laugh at you, it doesn't bother you if somebody else is laughing at you. This right mental attitude is so tremendously important. And since it is so important, what is the method that you use for getting up when you get down? Let's look at the first four things that we need to do. First of all, you got to face it. You're down. I mean, you know, that, that's just where you are. You look at it and say, hey, there I am. And then you can, uh, you can look and say, do I like what I see? Am I really happy being despondent, down in the dumps, miserable, and making everybody else miserable? Is this what I really want? But there I am. Face it. That's the first thing to do. You are down. And the second thing you need to do is understand the fact that there are no hopeless situations. There are only some people who lose hope in the face of some situations. You see, the darkest night since the beginning of time did not turn out all the stars. Then there's a third thing that you got to understand about this attitude of yours. You got to know that it is temporary. You see, this too will pass. And because it will pass, then know that your situation is temporary, that it's not always going to be that bad, and I don't care how bad it is. And when you know that it's temporary, when you accept that as the starting point, then you can begin to build it to exactly where you want it to be. And then there's the most important thing which I touched on just a moment ago, and that simply is to make a decision, decide how long you are going to be negative. Decide how long you're going to stay down. I decided to stay down several days because I'd lost a presidential election. I took that thing awful personal, you know. And then after I recognized what had happened after those several days, since then things have gotten better and better and better. Just decide how long 
you're going to stay down. If you feel like you deserve a little misery, that's perfectly all right. You don't drown by falling in water. You only drown if you stay there. And so what you got to decide to do is decide how long you're going to stay around swimming there. And then once you've decided that you're going to do something about it, then the minute you make the decision that you're going to come up, that's the very moment you made the decision about how long you're going to stay down. Rule number six is be committed. Most people are about as committed as a kamikaze pilot on his 39th mission. I never will forget, January 7th, 1992, I rode past the Plano, Texas Rec Center where I do my exercising and weightlifting. Had to back away from the weightlifting, I was booking up, and a lot of people thought I was on steroids, and you know, uh, my, re my reputation is such, can't do that, but I couldn't get in that day. No parking space, rode past, next day I was back by, this time I squeezed in, Went in the Nautilus room, and every machine had three, four, five, six people lined up. I couldn't fight that. I came back to the front desk, and I said to the young man, Sean, what on earth is going on? Old Sean grinned so wide he could have eaten a banana sideways as he responded to me. He said, Zig, don't worry about it. Don't give it a thought. Give us about three weeks. It'll be back to normal. These are our New Year's resolution people. You see, a lot of people, that's the way they do things. They make a resolution, and as long as it's convenient, involving no pain or trouble, and as long as they remember it, they'll be delighted, delighted to do it. But a commitment is absolutely necessary. Let me, let me kind of set a little scenario here to, to tell you what I'm talking about. He was an all-pro eight consecutive years. He had just signed a contract for $6.4 million dollars. And yet last year, this young man, who some of you probably have already figured it out, this young man, Hakeem, and this then in his native language, that means doctor or wise one, Olajuwon, and that in his language means being on top. And when you talk to Hakeem Olajuwon, he will talk to you about sacrifice and humility and equality and patience and tolerance and self-restraint and self-control and discipline. What did... Uh, he do last year between seasons he knew he had a weakness in his game it was a 15 foot jump shot 500 times a day he went out there and from 15 feet he practiced the jump shot all you got to do is check the records look at the score see what happened in the championship game and you'll discover that Houston would not have won the NBA championship had Akeem not perfected that shot because they were so close and those shots are what made the difference and what I'm talking about there as speakers is that's the difference between personal fulfillment or self-fulfillment and personal growth you see, self-fulfillment is the bodybuilder who goes to the gym and develops the muscles and spends all the time admiring that physique. Personal growth is that individual who goes to the gym and lifts those weights and practices those jump shots so he can be part of a winning team. Self-fulfillment is the dead sea. It's an end. Uh, uh, personal growth is the Sea of Galilee. It's a living, growing, vibrant water. Self-fulfillment is the student who learns so they can display their knowledge. Personal growth is the teacher who learns so they can teach. It's the speaker who acquires knowledge that is valuable to somebody else so they can communicate that to them. That's the difference, basically, in what I'm talking about. Rule number seven is don't set unrealistic expectations. I don't believe there's anybody in this country that is excited about positive thinking as I am. And I think one of the reasons for that is I understand what it will do, but I also understand what it won't do. I get a little unhappy and concerned when I hear some highly motivated individual stand up and say, man, with positive thinking, you can just do anything. Folks, that simply is not true. That is not positive thinking. That is new age thinking. Now, new age thinking simply says, in essence, all is one and one is all, and I am God. Well, there are three things I know. Number one, there is a God. Number two, it ain't me. 
Uh, number three, it ain't you either. <laughs> Let's get real. How many of you would rate me as being positive, optimistic, and upbeat? Can I see your hand? Well, that's what I am. I really am. But I got to tell you, if you need major surgery, <laughs> friend, I don't recommend me. Now, I'd do the best I can. I'd be positive, optimistic, and upbeat, but you'd still die. <laughs> Now, hear the rest of this because, you see, folks, unrealistic expectations are the seedbed of depression. If you think all you got to do is think positive, then, ladies and gentlemen, you're headed for a downfall. That positive thinking is step one. What positive thinking will do is let you use the ability which you have. That is awesome but it will not let you use something you do not have. Positive thinking won't let you do anything, but it will let you do everything better than negative thinking will. Rule number eight is have a go-give mentality. See, I don't care what you do in life. If you go to work for a company and want a good salary, you'll probably get it. But if you go to work for the company with the idea of working for them, not only will you get a better salary, but you'll get infinitely more satisfaction out of life. If you study your grades in school to make a grade, you probably will make a good grade. But if you will study for the knowledge that is there, if you'll really explore ambitiously what those books have to offer, not only will you get a better grade, but you also will get the knowledge that is so important. The go-give attitude is important. Rule number nine is find real success. I believe that success is getting a reasonable number of the things money will buy. Now, money is not everything, but it's reasonably close to oxygen. <laughs> I mean, you know, you just kind of got to have some of it. Uh, Admiral Hacker, I've had money and I haven't had money. I'm here to tell you it is better to have it. <laughs> now, generally speaking, the things I like cost money. See, I like to wear nice clothes. It costs money. I like to drive a nice car, live in a nice house. I like to take that beautiful red-headed wife of mine on, uh, on trips and into nice restaurants that all cost money. I, I like to play golf at the country club. It costs money. I like those things. But I got to tell you, I love the things money won't buy. See, money will buy me a nice house, but it won't buy me a home. Money will buy me a companion, but it won't buy me a friend. Money will buy me a bed, but it won't buy me a good night's sleep. Money will buy me a good time, but it won't buy me peace of mind. I want them all. And I just happen to believe that we can get all of those if we take certain steps and do certain things. I believe, yes, indeed, that we can get them all. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip, is learn to sell. You see, the nice thing about uh, selling is the security of it. Everybody works on a commission. My secretary, the president of our company, the president of the United States, the truck driver, anybody works on a commission, even if they have a salary, they're on a commission because the salary is dependent upon productivity. And if they do not produce, then it's just a question of time before the job itself is gone. And ladies and gentlemen, that's a fact. Why, you can even get to be the president of the United States. And if you don't produce like you ought to, they'll get you. How many of you had already heard uh, of that particular story, okay? Now, the question comes up, uh, all right, exactly secure, but is it realistic to say uh, that in the world of selling, you really are secure? Well, let me ask the question. How many of you in this audience today, live audience and in the seminar audience viewing the film, how many of you have been in the world of selling for as long as three years? Can I see your hand? How many of you made more money in 1981 than you did in 1980? Would you hold up your hand? How many of you made more in 82 than you made in 81? How many of you made more in 1983 uh, are going to make more in 83 than you did in 82? Can I now, what's this bit about recession? What's this bit about security? You see, the truth of the matter is uh, that you have so much control over your income in this world of selling. I imagine you're familiar with the story of the great racehorse, Nashua. Nashua won over one 
million dollars on the racetrack in less than an hour of actual racing. Hundreds of hours of training, hundreds of hours of practice, but one hour of racing. Now, as you well know, you can take a hundred dollars and buy ten, or rather, you can take a million dollars and buy one hundred ten thousand dollar racehorses. But a lot of people don't know the reason. The reason is because a million dollar horse runs exactly one hundred times as fast as a ten thousand dollar one. Right? <laughs> He doesn't? How much faster is a million dollar horse? Actually, would you say twice as fast? 50% faster, 20% faster, 10% faster? How much faster is a million dollar horse than a $10,000 one? Let me give an example, which I think pretty well says it. Five or six years ago at the Arlington Futurity, the winning racehorse received $100,000 more than the one who came in second place. Now, the Arlington Futurity is a race which is one and one-eighth miles in length, which, as you well know, is 71,280 inches. <laughs> you didn't know that, didn't you? Okay. <laughs> well, you know it now because that's a fact. I spent the day. I can tell you that's right. And the winning horse got there exactly one inches, one inch ahead of the one who came in second place. 71,280 inches of racing, the winner got there one inch in front of the second one. 1974, the winner of the Kentucky Derby, the jockey that rode that horse across the line first, get, was given a check for $27,000. Substantially less than two seconds later, jockey number four crossed the finish line, and they wrote him a check for $30. And somebody said, is that right? And I said, no, it ain't right, but that's the way they do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's always been the way they've done it. You see, we're not going to change the rules for the game of life. There's no commission for the salesman who almost makes a sale. And yet there's full commission if he just barely makes the sale. Now, what's the difference between just barely making it and just barely missing it. I believe so many times it's wrapped up in this thing called the right mental attitude. Does positive thinking work? Well, let's take you to a baseball game. It was a baseball game that was played a long time ago. It was played right here in Dallas, Texas, as a matter of fact. During the 1930s, when minor league baseball was real baseball, the San Antonio team had seven hitters on the team that had hit over 300 the year before. Everybody figured they was going to win the pennant because that many 300 hitters on a team, how are you going to beat them? But the truth of the matter is they lost the first game and the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth. As a matter of fact, at the end of 21 games, that San Antonio team had lost the first 18 games. The pitcher was blaming the catcher. The catcher was blaming the infield. The infield was blaming the outfield. The manager was blaming this, that, and the other. And everybody was blaming the manager. But in reality, the manager was a good one. His name was O'Reilly. He knew there wasn't a thing wrong with his team except the fact they were, suffering from, from, they were suffering from stinking thinking. In other words, they needed that little check up from the neck up as well. So because of the fact that they had played this one game in Dallas, had been beaten one to nothing. As a matter of fact, the only hit they got was a scratch single, and that was by the pitcher. And now they were getting ready for the second game. Well, at this time, there was a fellow in Dallas named Slater who was a faith healer. Oh, they said that Mr. Slater could just do anything, and so O'Reilly devised a plan. Just before the game was to start, about 30 minutes before, he rushed into the clubhouse. He said, fellas, give me your two best bats. I'm going I'm, I'm to take them somewhere. When they come back, we'll have the answer. We're going to win the game today. Don't worry about a thing. He was excited. About two minutes before game time, he came back in. He had those bats in that wheelbarrow, the two best bats from each man, and he was really excited. As a matter of fact, if you think he'd been excited before this time, you should have seen him. He was on fire with enthusiasm. He was burning up. He said, fellas, I've taken these bats to Mr. Slater. He's put his blessings on him. He says that all we got to do is step up, to that play, step up to that plate, take a cut. He says, we're going to knock the ball out of there. He says, we're going to win the game today. We're going to win the penalty. He said, fellas, go get them, Tigers. And guess what? the Tigers did that day. Now remember, this is a team that had been beaten one to nothing the day before. They'd only gotten one hit, and that was a scratch single. But today, same ballpark, same team, same circumstances, this team, the San Antonio team, got 37 hits. They scored 22 runs. They hit 11 home runs. I don't think I need to add that they won the game. <laughs> 
As a matter of fact, they went on to win the pennant. But ladies and gentlemen, here is the kicker. For years, they sold Slater bats around the Texas League at an enormous premium. But the interesting thing is they never proved that Slater had ever even seen the bats. Let me ask you a question. Suppose he had seen the bats. What could a, a, a fellow do to a pile of wood? <laughs> we know he couldn't do anything at all. But what could he do to the minds of the men who were swinging that wood? If you knew you were going to get a base hit, wouldn't you step up there with more enthusiasm, with more zeal, with more determination, and with more confidence, knowing that you were going to get a hit? And isn't that really what positive thinking is all about? For Zig Ziglar's ultimate motivation video, check it out right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. When somebody says, how you doing, and you really are doing bad, I mean, things are just awful. What I want you to do is look at your watch. When they say, how you doing, I want you to look at your watch and say, well, at exactly 3.30, I'll be doing super good.